Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Cathy Bolan. Um, I have the pleasure of being your MC this afternoon. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce renowned cancer researcher and Nobel laureate, Dr. Harold Varmus. Dr. Varmus began his academic career with a degree in literature before taking a different tack and going to med school. Along with Professor Michael Bishop, he received the Nobel Prize for their groundbreaking discovery about the origin of cancer. They identified a large family of genes that control the normal growth and division of cells. They proved that disturbances in one or some of these so-called oncogenes can lead a normal cell to transform into a tumour cell, resulting in cancer. Their research launched a golden age in research into cancer. Dr. Varmus has also been a passionate advocate for investment in scientific research and for open access to scientific publications. He's been an advisor to presidents. He's a former director of the National Institute of Health in the US, responsible for an $18 billion budget a year. He's been recognized for leadership on clinical and AIDS research. He's held advisory roles for organizations such as the World Health Organization, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and also to Harvard and MIT. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Harold Varmus. Okay, well thanks very much. It was mentioned that the length of this talk would depend on how I was feeling. I feel fine. Um, but my goal here today is to try to engage with you guys. Um, I assume that many of you are, have taken science courses. Everyone raise their hand if they've taken some science courses. How many of you are seniors? Why aren't you taking your exams this week? I thought this was exam week. How many are juniors? 12th, 11th year, 10th year, 9th year, 8th year, whoa, 7th year, holy cow, 6th, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, all right. Um, so you've heard a tiny bit about me. I'm going to tell you a little bit more. Um, my goal today is, first of all, to spend a little time on four topics. First, I want to talk a little bit about how and when you should de decide to become a scientist. How many of you want to be scientists? Not too many. You've had your science courses, but only a few think you want to be scientists. And I think that the ones who want to be scientists are among the youngest in the room. We shall see. Then I want to talk a little bit about what it's like to be a scientist. Um, as you heard, I've been one, but there are many ways to be a scientist, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Then I want to talk a little bit about um, why um, thinking like a scientist is an important way to think, even if you're not actually doing science. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about something we often forget which is that the public supports most scientists, especially those who are doing basic science and working in academic institutions, schools. Uh, and we ought to ask something about why it's important for a country like Australia to bother with science. Why not let the US do it or Europe? Why does it matter? So um, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'm going to you know, just raise your hand. I'll call on you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a few things on these four topics for a little while until I see your eyes glazing over. And then we'll stop and we'll actually open things up for formal questions. There'll be microphones passed around. But if you have a question as I'm going, just stop me. My goal here is not to lecture to you. You probably get a lot of that in your schools. Um, when, I give a course to undergraduates at the City University of New York in my spare time, and we just have 20 students sitting around the table, and we talk, and um, there's no lecture. And I'd like to try to recreate that, although we have a few more students than 20 in the room. Um, still, let's try to create an exchange. So um, how do you become a scientist, and what should the reasons be, and when should you do that? And in my own life, um, a lot of things, a lot of happenstances were required for 
me to end up doing what, I, what I've done for the last 40 years or so. Because in a sense, as you'll hear, I didn't really become a scientist until I was about 30 years old, almost 30. So I grew up on the south shore of Long Island. I know it's far from here, but it's a place near New York City. Everybody know where New York City is? Good. Um, when I was very young, uh, we moved from the place of my birth near New York down to Florida because my father was a, was a doctor in the Air Force, and uh, that was during World War II, which must seem like ancient history to you. Um, it is almost ancient history. Um, and uh, when I, we moved back to the south shore of Long Island, and I went to what we call, we call public schools, state schools run by uh, New York State. And uh, I didn't show any particular interest in science. I read a lot of novels. I spent a lot of time at the beach. Um, and I played tennis and other sports. Uh, and uh, I never had a really great science teacher in all my years in what was called Freeport High School. Um, I went off to camps where I learned a lot of stuff, but I didn't really ever go to science camp or learn things that uh, other students in my classes were learning about science. Um, nevertheless, my father was a doctor. Uh, like many people in Australia, um, many of us in America come from recent immigrants. Uh, my, my parents were both the children of immigrants who had come from uh, either Central Europe, in my mother's case, or Eastern Europe, in my father's case. Uh, and uh, parent, the grandparents were um, chased out of Europe in part because of anti-Semitism. Uh, they came to um, the United States around the turn of the century, or just before, or just after 1900. Uh, but as is possible in America, and I think possible in Australia as well, uh, people coming from abroad, from poor backgrounds, can very rapidly change social status by getting a good education. My mother went to a, a well-known uh, women's college named Wellesley. My father went to a Harvard College for a while and then to medical school. My mother got a degree in, in social work um, with a psychiatric um, uh, angle to it. And um, so I grew up in a household where taking care of people, um, an interest in health science was important. Um, my parents were interested in public welfare, doing things for the community. And I grew up in that atmosphere, but I wasn't told that I should do a certain thing. And uh, so my tendency, like the tendency of most kids, is to do what seemed like fun, what I enjoyed. Um, didn't feel any pressure to be in the medical profession or to do science, but it certainly seemed like an option, and if you were growing up in a household like mine, yes, it was likely you would end up doing something in the health professions. But I went off to college um, thinking, yes, I'm probably a pre-medical student, but unlike in the English system of education, you didn't have to declare any particular professional ambition when, when you entered. And indeed, I went off to learn as much as I could about everything at a small college in New England called Amherst College. And there, um, without uh, too much ado, uh, I found that, yes, I liked science and was pretty good at it, but um, I also liked philosophy and history and English literature. And before I knew it, I was doing a thesis on Charles Dickens. Everyone know who Charles Dickens was? A uh, well-known English novelist, um, and uh, became interested in um, various kinds of poetry as, as well as, as novels, and decided that as a senior at college, I would just, in a sense, let, um, let chance take its hand. And I, I applied to spend time abroad. I applied for medical school. I applied to graduate school in English. And then when push came to shove, I decided, because I had gotten a fellowship to go study English literature at Harvard, that I'd do that. So, I went off to literature school, um, got interested in um, reading work in Anglo-Saxon, um, the, the, the language that preceded English. Um, but along the way, I learned that uh, my friends 
my college uh, classmates who were at medical school seemed to be having a little more fun than I was and were more eager to get out of bed in the morning. So I thought maybe I should reconsider medicine um, and uh, my graduate school friends being um, a little less excited about their intellectual activities. And at um, that point, um, I applied to medical school again, was cautioned by um, some um, uh, admission officers that my behavior was a little eccentric and maybe I should go in the army for a while and grow up. Uh, that wasn't too appealing at a time when American forces were growing rapidly in Vietnam. So um, I decided to go to a different medical school, Columbia, and um, um, found that uh, initially um, I was interested in psychiatry because I thought I could put psychiatry and literature together in some interesting way. But um, as time went on, I became more interested in internal medicine and then in, in what we now call global health. Working abroad, I spent some time in India. But throughout all this, I basically didn't do any science. I was learning some clinical medicine. I enjoyed it. I learned what I needed to, needed to know to, to think about uh, the common illnesses that people have. Um, and uh, as people uh, still do. After I graduated from medical school, I went uh, to a training program in a hospital, so-called residency program. But something else was happening in the country that proved to be extremely important. Our engagement in Vietnam had gotten very, very deep, and there was a program created by the government that required that everybody who had a medical degree had to do some form of public service, which usually meant going in the Army or Navy or Marines and going abroad uh, to Vietnam. But there were some escape clauses for those of us who were, as I was, passionately opposed to the war, thinking we didn't have a role in Vietnam. I didn't understand why we were there. Uh, and the alternatives were to work in the public health service. That meant working either on what we called Indian reservations or uh, a center for doing epidemiology, that's the so-called centers for disease control, or working as um, in clinical or basic research at the National Institutes of Health. And I was fortunate, despite my lack of research experience, to be allowed to go to the NIH and work with a stellar young scientist. And for the first time, I was doing experiments every day and learning what it was like to work on the frontier. And I got excited about that. Good thing about the work we were doing is that it was, it was exciting. We were discovering new things. We were trying to understand how bacteria regulate the expression of their genes. And you all understand that kind of language, how genes are expressed, whether they're, whether they're actually interpreted to make the proteins that genes encode. I see some heads nodding. Sounds like you're getting some good instruction biology here in Australia. That's good. Um, but I didn't feel totally comfortable um, with the idea of being a bacterial geneticist. I really wanted to do something that connected my, my work to, to medicine if I was going to stay in, in science. And in those days, most of us who were trying to learn something about being scientists at the NIH, we're all in our late 20s, I was 28, 29, um, were uh, taking courses in the evening given by outstanding scientists. And along the way, I began to learn about viruses that cause cancer and about how cancer was becoming approachable as a, as a disease that could be, could be understood in what we call molecular terms. Uh, that is um, understood um, as uh, a disease in which genes are maybe altered in some way at a time before the kinds of techniques you're all learning about, recombinant DNA techniques and DNA sequencing and so forth were even invented, so they weren't possible to be used for trying to understand how, how cancer cell works. So um, I learned enough from these classes to decide I would give science a try as a more in, on a more independent basis. And when I had completed my, mili my so-called military service as a scientist at the NIH, I went out to California and worked with some folks and 
became incredibly passionate about trying to understand how cancer works by studying cancer viruses. So at that point, I was 30 years old. Many of you think you have to make up your minds before you enter university, age of 17 or 18. And let me make a strong case that you not feel that you're under an obligation to make a career decision at such an early age. Let yourself be exposed as broadly as possible to things you find interesting. And if it happens to be science, find a way into it. I know the, the school system here doesn't always seem as flexible as it might, but um, uh, I think there's a, a, a lesson to be learned from, um, from my story and from people uh, like me who uh, postponed an ultimate decision about whether to lead a life as a scientist. So we'll come back to this question of how people become scientists. It's a very interesting issue to me. Sometimes it's a result of inspiration about what science can do. Sometimes it's a result of exposure to a scientific experience. It's like the one I had when I was nearly 30. But let's turn to this question of what it means to be a scientist. And for me, doing science is basically a process by which you try to understand this bizarre universe into which we were born by observing things, by using machines to try to detect signs of how the universe works. By the universe, I mean everything, not just stars, but our cells, our um, other organisms, um, how, the, how the Earth operates as a, as a functional system. Um, and uh, there are a lot of disciplines. And one of the things you learn about science, hopefully at your high school, is that science is a lot of different things. It's life sciences, it's uh, earth sciences, it's physics, it's chemistry, it's math, it's computational science, it's technology, it's engineering. And indeed, all of these um, disciplines uh, have a role in trying to make discoveries and make use of discoveries. So because science is a multitude of disciplines, there are many ways to be a scientist. And um, the way you experience science differs dramatically depending on what discipline you use and depending upon what your role in the scientific community might be. In my own case, which may be a, a little eccentric, but still um, I think there are some messages here, you know, I began doing science by being another guy standing at the bench uh, and putting experiments together. One thing I learned almost immediately is that the idea of the lonely, solitary scientist working by himself and uh, as a lone genius is completely wrong, that science is an incredibly social activity. It's one that, uh, that requires you to work with your colleagues, sometimes one or two, sometimes many, to share ideas uh, and to um, put your findings into the public domain for inter further interaction. So you go to meetings, you write papers, uh, and uh, it, one of the beauties of science is that uh, what you do as an individual scientist is the product of your imagination, but the results have very little meaning unless a community of scientists agrees with your findings. So it's both an act of individual uh, intellectual work, and it's also a social contract in which what you find is accepted only when people believe your evidence and agree with your reasoning. So it's tough. In my own career, I, I stayed as an experimental scientist for quite a long time, about 20 years. But along the way, I had increasing numbers of students and postdoctoral fellows and technicians working with me, and science became more and more a supervisory, advisory kind of thing. That is, I'd sit down with different people every day, talk about their aspirations, their, their plans, their findings, and tried to put together some interpretation of what they're doing and what they should do next. So there is a large part of being a scientist that's not actually doing experiments with your own hands. It's working with others and helping them do the experiments that, re that reveal how nature is working. 
I was fortunate along the way to, um, to become recognized by my peers because of certain work we did that brought in certain prizes. And before I knew it, even though I hadn't really sought this kind of, um, of uh, adventure, I suddenly found myself being asked to, to run institutions. And for about 20 some years, I ran um, first the National Institutes of Health, where I had been trained, then a big cancer center in New York called Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and then the National Cancer Institute, which is part of the NIH. And in all those phases, again, I was working as a scientist, but it was as a scientist administrator and politician, working with government officials, with, with donors to research, uh, with leaders of different components of these institutions, not so much to plan individual experiments, but to think about how an institution that's doing science organizes its resources and its people to make the science that we're doing successful. So that's another way of being a scientist. We move to question, to issue number three, which has to do with um, the question of how scientists think and with my claim that that uh, the world would be a better place if everyone thought like a scientist, even though not everybody does science. Now, I'm a great fan of novels. I believe in the imagination. I love movies and plays. These are works of the imagination that I think are exceptional. But science brings something else to the game, which is incredibly important, and that is they bring evidence that's, the, that's wrestled out of the, the, the natural world in which we live, and everything that a scientist does, if that scientist is honest and has what I would call the right ambitions, is built on an analysis of that evidence and a desire to make the world a better place by understanding more profoundly how the world works. And I would argue that that attitude doesn't need to be applied only to the natural world. It should be applied to the financial world, to, uh, to politics, to um, virtually everything that we do. There is evidence, you look at it, um, whether it's reading a poem and looking at the words on the page, or whether it's uh, trying to interpret history, bringing in the evidence, analyzing it the way a scientist does, to my way of thinking, is a step in the right direction. The last thing I want to say is about the value of science. Uh, I've stressed here that um, there's an inherent value in trying to know how the natural world works. And I do believe that's, that does have inherent value, and that uh, if you look at the history of inventions and patents and entrepreneurship and making things that are of value to consumers, whether those consumers are patients or um, are people who simply want to use the next new electronic tool or tweet out something from this meeting. Um, almost all of the things that we enjoy in life as um, advanced technologies have their basis in uh, a, uh, a form of science in which commercial interest is not so important. For countries to succeed economically and to have these products that people want to buy, it's important for every country to have a very strong scientific base. And history shows through the studies of economics and, and uh, um, intellectual history that successful countries have large investments in science. It helps to produce a, a, a um, a productive healthcare industry, it helps the economy, uh, it helps uh, to um, uh, raise the, 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 the general level uh, in which a country works, uh, it helps uh, in developing a national defense against potential enemies, and um, while science has been used for bad things in the past, we, no one denies that, we wouldn't have had an atomic bomb without, without science. Um, in general, I think the, 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 the results of any vote about the utility of science would be in favor of it. And that's why countries that do have the resources, like Australia, Europe, 
U.S. have made those investments. It's not always clear to people why countries should spend money on science, but in my own view, uh, it's very important for people to know enough about science and know something about its benefits so that when people are in the position of electing representatives who will vote on science budgets, that those folks understand the value of science to the citizens who elected them. Uh, I've had a fair amount of experience as a government, um, a government employee to know that, that um, being effective in going to a member of Congress, the public's representatives to, um, to um, that, that make the laws, including the laws that, uh, that provide money to research institutions, that it is critical that, that the public weigh in on the side of science. And that will only happen if the public is, uh, the public is educated about what science has and can produce for, for um, the country. And whether it's security, whether it's worrying about how we deal with um, the threats to our environment, climate change, shortages of energy as the world gets wealthier and wants more energy. Uh, these are all issues that join with uh, our continual concerns about, about health and about food production to generate a, um, a, a consensus that, that, that science is a way for countries to improve themselves and to better the state of the world. So I've tried to say a few things about four topics. How and when you become a scientist, what's it like to be a scientist, uh, what, is, uh, uh, what are the benefits of having people think of, uh, like scientists if they're doing other things, and why the public should support science. I by no means exhausted these topics, but I'd like to hear now something from you about your own uh, aspirations as, as uh, young people who will take the positions that uh, we senior scientists now have and will hopefully populate the world with, uh, with strong scientists in the future. So I'm open to questions about any of the things I've mentioned, things I haven't mentioned. Um, but I would, at this point, like to see a few more hands raised. And, uh, I would just ask you to please, if you could please use, use the microphone, just because we're also recording the yes. session to put it online, right. so that way we'll, people who view it will get to hear your questions. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Ash from John Monash Science School. Uh, I'd just like to ask, uh, what's the problem with overqualification? So students going uh, straight into a uni degree and then progressing further with their masters and uh, PhD then being in a position where they're really qualified, but there aren't enough positions available for them to fill in. So there is a problem in the US, and there may be one here as well. I don't know as much about the, the demographics of your, your science uh, trainee population and your more senior scientists. Uh, the difficulty in the US has been pretty simple. That is, uh, we have a lot more people training to become scientists than we have academic positions for scientists. One of the problems has been, is an inherent problem. It's very, scientific careers are long, and it's very difficult to plan, have a planned economy for educating the right number of people for a certain number of jobs. So that's an inherent problem. But there are other problems that I think we have, give us some opportunities to overcome this, uh, uh, this um, call it an economic problem if you want. Um, and that is that most people who go to schools and learn science from their professors are taught about science as it's practiced in the academic sector. And of course, there are many people who do science in the industrial sector. They use science in jobs that are very much science related, like running businesses that have a very strong scientific base even becoming politicians who are responsible for the scientific sector, um, working in financial industries and making use of computational sciences. So one of the things that we're working on in the biological sector in the US is to teach students when they enter graduate programs that there are many routes to being a scientist and many things a scientist can do, and that not everybody can become um, the leader of an academic 
research team, we currently estimate that people who enter graduate schools, PhD programs in biology have about a one in eight to one in 12 chance of actually becoming a professor with a laboratory group. And that's something important for people to realize at the beginning, that first of all, it's not necessarily right for everybody to get a full PhD, that sometimes master's degrees are sufficient for having a scientific component of a career that may be incredibly satisfying and very productive, um, and that everyone has got to measure their own aptitudes against the standards for different kinds of, uh, different ways to use um, a scientific education. So I certainly don't deny that a problem exists, and uh, those of us who are paying attention to how our major funding agency in the U.S., the, the National Institutes of Health, gives out its grants, knows that, uh, that it's very difficult to get started as an independent investigator, that success rates for grant applicants are low, and that uh, the, the average age of someone receiving their first grant is too high, and we're trying to use a variety of measures to increase the chances that people are successful early, early on. But you can't apply for a grant if you don't have a job and a place to do research. And people who enter graduate school simply need to know more than they currently know about what the realities of, of a career in science. It's, it is a, it's a satisfying career, but it's also competitive, uh, especially in certain high-profile fields like biomedical research. Um, my name is Boris. Um, and I'm from John Monash. Um, so I was just interested in the um, differences between um, uh, funding for scientific research uh, coming from private uh, companies, which have the um, motivation of money and um, products in mind, versus uh, government funding, which um, there can be some complications, such as in America right now, where um, the government's, um, or certain presidential elections might um, remove the uh, focus of the uh, government funding so that it's not um, on science, um, and how those two, two different sources impact the scientific research. Okay, let me try to deconstruct your question a little bit. So, because <laughs> it covers a lot of territory. So, yes, first of all, there are many streams of support for science. Um, in, even in the academic setting, not all money comes from the NIH. Quite a bit comes from charity. Some comes from private donors. Some comes from big foundations. Some comes from industry. Uh, that money, when it comes into an academic setting, is almost always uh, um, tailored so that it's actually used to support basic research, which may benefit all the various players who are providing the money. In industry, which does quite a lot of research, the nature of the research may vary because companies are spending money on research at their, in their own headquarters to, in general, to promote the development of products that they're going to sell or the refinement of products, or the research may even be about how to best advertise a product that's already for sale. So there are a lot of economic motivations that make that kind of funding a little bit different. With respect to your question about politics, um, you know, many of us are concerned about uh, our new president's apparent obliviousness to what science is all about, his lack of interest in evidence, uh, and I am deeply troubled by that because I've worked with many presidents, uh, and everyone I've worked with, whether Republican or Democrat, fiscal conservative or, or liberal, uh, has had a great deal of respect for science and a belief that you work things out by looking at evidence. But it, our country is not a parliamentary democracy. It's, a, it's got a balance of powers that I think is, so far at least, protecting us pretty well from uh, the current disrespect of science that I'm seeing every day from the executive branch. Congress, although um, split on some issues on strict party lines is still quite supportive of science and, the, and Congress provides a strong balance of power with the executive branch so that so far the efforts that our new president has made to cut budgets for science agencies has, 
has not been successful, um, and uh, we do have some serious problems with respect to uh, a lack of appointments of scientific leaders of agencies that are doing science, so that's been a problem. But, but uh, in general, the efforts to undermine science by stripping budgets has not happened. In the case of the NIH, which is the agency that I know most about and follow most closely, uh, although the administration has tried to cut our budget by as much as 20 percent, in fact, Congress has been supporting increases in our budget, and um, the, the, the size of the budget has actually gone from roughly 30 billion at the time that, uh, that uh, President Trump was elected uh, to what will likely be about 34 billion when this year's budgetary negotiations are over. So uh, we have some protection in the nature of the, the democratic process that we enjoy in the U.S. Yeah, thank you. Um I just wanted to, uh, you talked about uh, at the beginning of your question, uh, the, your answer, um, about uh, companies focusing more on um, their uh, aims. Um, what do you think about private uh, funded science um, researching just pure science without any um, direct commercial benefits? Well, when you say private, do you mean non-governmental in general? Because a lot of our at an institution like mine, for example, at, at, at Cornell, um, probably 80 or 85 percent of our outside money comes from NIH, but a lot of it comes from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute or um, there are other large private funders. Um, there are donors you will never hear of who simply are grateful patients or families of patients, uh, and their money goes into basic research without any equivocation. When companies give money to a place, to an educational institution like Cornell, mm -hmm. in general, uh, there's a, a buffering of the influence of that money. That is, uh, the money cannot be used to develop products for the company that gave the money. Uh, at the most extreme, there might be, uh, it, it is true that, that a lot of the research that's being done these days has practical value, and that's good and universities are involved in, uh, in trying to um, commercialize the research that's been done. And they do that usually by licensing, by patenting and licensing out the, the access to the discovery. Uh, but in general, um, the, when money is brought into the university, it comes with some guarantees that, that, uh, that any discoveries that are made will be available to, to many companies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I see a good uh, hand up here. Hi, I'm Vidanj. I'm from Patterson River Secondary College. And can I just start off by saying I really like your tie? Also, um, with- There are several brands of this tie available at the Cold Spring Harbor <laughs> Laboratory shop. Uh, I'm not trying to advertise for them, but, <laughs> but uh, one day I appeared, I was mentioned in the newspaper as appearing uh, at a prestigious party without a tie. This actually was not true, but nevertheless, my friends at Cold Spring Harbor took pity on me and sent me a uh, representative of every one of the patterns of, of uh, DNA and RNA ties that they make, and these are available online. Yeah. Also, in regards to cancer research, how do you think it'll be cu cured? Do you think it'll be by genetics or something like antibiotics? Well, not antibiotics, <laughs> yeah. but, but uh, let, let, me, let me take a step back. First of all, as, uh, if you come tonight, as you will hear in some detail, uh, one characteristic of cancers is their variety, the heterogeneity. So to talk about a cure for cancer simply uh, doesn't make any sense. Secondly, uh, there are lots of ways to control cancer independent of cures, for example, uh, independent of, of therapies uh, or independent of new therapies. For one thing, we know how to prevent many cancers. Anybody here smoke? No one's going to admit it. Um, but by not using tobacco, we would spare a lot of lives across this, this audience. Um, there were vaccines against a couple of viruses that we know cause cancer, and you probably have all heard of vaccines against human hepatitis B virus and human papillomaviruses. Australia has had a very good record in, in making use of these vaccines. These vaccines 
don't require a cure because you don't, if you take the vaccine, you don't get the cancer. Um, and um, then, but then let's go to the next step because we, you know, despite our efforts to diagnose cancer extremely early before it's actually a frank, threatening cancer, despite our interest in trying to prevent it, uh, cancers do develop and they, they are diagnosed every day. I don't know what the numbers are in Australia, but uh, there are roughly one and a half million new cases of cancer in the U.S. every year, and we have to have ways to treat these, these cancers. Many cancers are very successfully treated with traditional surgical methods. They're methods that are continually being improved, but, um, and, but they cure a lot of cancers. Chemotherapy, although often um, criticized because of the, the side effects, is still effective way to slow the growth of cancers and cures some people. And we have radiotherapy, which is increasingly effective. And then we have two new major forms of, of cancer therapy that are very, very important. One of which I'll talk about tonight, if any of you come to the lecture, um, and that is to use drugs that specifically inhibit the mutant proteins that drive certain forms of cancer. These new therapies are strategic, they're targeted, they're less toxic than traditional chemotherapy, but they, do, they, they don't offer cures in the conventional sense. They have to be continually used. Cancers are clever, they're continuing to change genetically and they become resistant to these therapies. So far from perfect, I think we can dramatically improve the way in which we use targeted therapies. Um, talk about that in more detail, but I'm not sure that's, this is the right setting for that. Then there's a, another new form of therapy called immunotherapy, in which we try to harness the strengths of the immune system, which normally is unable to eliminate cancers, but there are ways to play with the immune system, which is a, a, com, a, a complex system with various levers that, that make immune cells work or inhibit immune cells, and if we if we play with those levers in the right way, uh, we've been able to show in the last uh, decade or so that uh, there are many cancers, certainly five or 10% of cancers overall, that can be helped by um, making changes in the way the immune system views the cancer and reacts to it. So I'm optimistic about improving both targeted therapies and immunotherapies so that we can d further diminish the the uh, mortality of cancer in general. In America, and I think in most other countries in the so-called advanced economies like Australia, the death rate, annual death rate after adjusting for age has been coming down by about one and a half percent a year. And that's a good sign. It's not as dramatic as the decline in, in death rates for, for heart disease and uh, other vascular diseases like strokes. But it is appreciable progress, and I think we'll have a lot more progress in the future. I'm very optimistic because we understand so much more about cancer. But there won't be a single cure. It's just the cancers are inherently too, too various from a genetic perspective and from the perspective of the different tissues in which cancers arise. Thank you. So we have lots of ladies with questions now. But um, you, you're the first. Unfortunately, I don't know what your name is yet, so I can't. And there's somebody over here. Yes, good, okay. We want to get parity here, at least as many questions from female students as male students. Yeah. So, hello, like, my name is Ling, and I'm from Glen Waverley Secondary College. Um, I've personally done some research about the harsh realities of scientists. And like, so the first question I want to ask you is, as there are so many difficulties in research, what is some exciting excitements like, and some like, very exciting stories that you found that motivates you to continue your career in science? Yeah, would you mind to share with it? Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, obviously some scientists have better luck than others. Some people work hard, don't get very exciting results for one reason or another, don't get their grants, don't get promoted, and they leave the academic sector. They may end up 
somewhere else working in a team. Um, but I, I don't think that, uh, that people tend to leave science because they have found it boring. I think most scientists find it exciting to be a scientist, um, but not everybody succeeds, and that's a reality that I think everybody's got to face when they enter a scientific career. Um, you know, in my own life, I've been very lucky. I had, you know, I wandered around looking for a career for 10 years, and then I entered uh, this field of research on cancer viruses at a time when a couple of extraordinary discoveries were made. And there are two ways to view that. Um, I was driving across the country from Washington to California to start a new position with my wife in 1970, and there were two amazing discoveries that summer. One was the discovery of an enzyme that copies RNA to make DNA, the so-called reverse transcriptase that some of you may have heard about. Uh, and one of the reasons why I had chosen the, the training program I had chosen is because I was interested in looking for ways uh, to, for an RNA virus to make a DNA copy of itself. So you could have argued, yeah, before I even started, I was already scooped. Uh, the other big discovery was the discovery of a mutant form of a, of a gene that allows the virus I was going to work with to, to, ca to uh, cause cancer. And that, that mutation was extremely revealing in ways that I will actually describe tonight. And you could have argued again, gee, you know, that's something that would have been really great for me to discover. But my re reaction to that was not, you know, the, the world has come to an end, the things I wanted to do have been done. Uh, my reaction to that was to say, we have these, this, these new pieces of knowledge and it's now possible for us to, uh, there, there's my wife who I just mentioned, but you didn't hear me mention her. Um, uh, and uh, to say, we're gonna build on these discoveries and go even deeper into an understanding of, of how, how, how a cell becomes a cancer cell. So I think I'm just trying to uh, embroider a deeper answer onto your question about what makes you excited. Some people do get depressed when they think someone else has gotten to an answer first. But if you think about the other side of it, every discovery builds a, form, a stronger foundation for the next set of questions. Science doesn't end because someone else has made a discovery. But, exactly. but, but I am in agreement with you that uh, you know, science does uh, present challenges. It's hard to do. And uh, if somebody works at it for some years and simply is not getting findings, I would argue that, uh, yes, there may be a message there that uh, not simply unlucky, but you may be not going about it in the right way. And you ought to think about ways to, do, to use your scientific education and in a different way. As I mentioned earlier when I was discoursing about point two or three, um, it, there are lots of ways to be a scientist. It may be the right thing to do with what you know is to use science in some other occupation. Yes, oh, you, you're, you're not done, okay. Yeah, I'm not done. Yet. There are other hands over here, but then there's somebody down here who's gone back there, yes, okay. So what, what's, the re what's the rest of the question? So out of like, at the time when you have, when you were doing, when you started to become interested in medical science, um, cancer must have been a very new and emerging field of study. So what is, what is it that makes you choose cancer as your main field of study? Okay. Well, first of all, I would, I would disagree that cancer research was new at that point. Okay. Um, I would say that cancer research had become very exciting. In fact, that's one of the things I'm going to talk about in the oration tonight, is how uh, for the first couple of hundred years of cancer research, uh, it was pretty much confined to making observations. There weren't tools to understand how a normal cell became a cancer cell. You had to really rely on, on the kind of evidence that's not very compelling to people who want to reduce science to its moving parts. So there was a revolution happening and a couple of the, the, the um, 
the developments that occurred when my wife and I were driving across the United States in 1970 were among those technical um, advances that, that made it seem more exciting. And I would argue that uh, cancer research is even more exciting now because we have such incredible power in our hands for taking uh, the entire genome, a full set of genes of an organism apart and looking at every nook and cranny of, of, uh, of a cancer cell and trying to understand how it works. The, the power of these new techniques is uh, daunting. Let's let uh, the lady in front of you who's um, been waiting patiently have the microphone. Um, so I'm Seneca from Glen Waverley Secondary College, and I was just wondering what sort of... When you say college, we, yeah. do we mean a high school? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah. That's what I thought. I'm just um, a poor yeah. American. We don't know. what we, we think college is something else. But yeah, no, high school. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering what sort of work, like research work, have you or your institution been doing recently, like your recent research? My recent research? Yes. Okay. Well, um, you know, I don't want to get too bogged down in this, but let me, let me see if I can uh, spell it out um, in, in terms that everybody can understand. So one of the things that we now do fairly routinely in the cancer research community is look at the full set of mutations in any cancer. And sometimes these mutations are in genes we're very familiar with, but sometimes they're in genes that are big surprises. Um, and one of the things my lab works on is the, the, the nature of mutations that affect the ability of a cell to link up pieces, of, uh, parts of an RNA molecule that, that code proteins. And many of you may recognize this as RNA splicing. Now, none of us would have predicted 10 years ago that, that uh, the genes that direct a cell to splice its RNA might be involved in cancer, but it turns out that they clearly are involved, and without going into details, uh, my lab and maybe 30 or 40 others around the country, around the U.S. and a few labs elsewhere in Europe, are trying to understand why these genes and how these genes make a contribution to cancer, because if we understand that, first we just understand cancer more deeply to begin with, but there are um, some treatment opportunities that are raised by understanding that kind of process, which affects perhaps 10% of cancers overall. Uh, so that's one example. Another example I will show tonight for those of you who come, and that is we're trying to uh, look at the way in which a normal cell becomes a cancer cell, not by just taking the most convenient set of, of cells and genes that happen to be available, but instead directly recapitulating human cancer by using human cells that come from uh, the, basically human stem cells, turning them into one kind of, of cell, in this case, a lung cell that we know is very likely to be the immediate precursor to a type of fairly common and highly malignant lung cancer known as small cell lung cancer. And we know now that we can change that that uh, lung cell precursor into a cancer by making certain changes in that cell using genetic tricks so that the cell resembles very closely the kind of cell that we can extract from a mature tumor. So that shows how far we've advanced in trying to understand uh, uh, the origins of human cancer by trying to do experiments that, comp that uh, faithfully recapitulate what must be going on when human cancer occurs by a more uh, uh, hit or miss process. Now, those are just two examples of the kinds of things we're trying to, we're trying to do. Hello, my name's Sahana. I'm from the Knox School. Um, I just wanted to ask that in the field of cancer re research, has there ever been any talk of looking into or incl inclination into looking into researching um, like alternate, um, alternative therapies for cancer research, not just conventional medicine? Well, everything's an alternative therapy until it's a, until it's a regular therapy. So uh, I don't think anybody I know um, operates with the assumption that something that is new is wrong. Um, there are a lot of ideas about how to treat cancer that 
will be met with skepticism because they don't seem to have much basis in a much reasonable basis. So um, there may be skepticism, but uh, there is within the National Cancer Institute at the NIH and within the NIH as a whole um, centers, institutes that have um, the major goal to look at what people call alternative therapies. I think I'm being a little um, cagey about the name because uh, the word alternative doesn't necessarily mean uh, that, uh, that it's different from other things that were alternative therapies uh, before they became accepted therapies. So my, my view is if there's sufficient reason to put together uh, a, an experiment or a clinical trial to find out whether something works, you do it. And if it works, you, uh, you embrace it and try to understand how it works and see what you can learn from it. Um, and, uh, but it also has to be said that, that um, many so-called alternative therapies that, for which there is not very much evidence to begin with, when subjected to rigorous clinical testing, almost uniformly do not work. So that's been the experience of the, the NIH's Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, that, uh, that things without much of a rational basis in general just didn't work. They may have seemed to have worked in certain cases because, you know, people get better on their own, and if you don't set up a, a, a test of a new therapy in an appropriate way, it's very easy to get misled. So, I think our MC is telling us that you all have to go out and uh, Yes, and we need to let them go. Do something but else. They also need to let you go. So, um, a fascinating afternoon, I'm sure, one that you'll all remember. Could you please put your hands together and give a very warm thanks to Dr. Harold Barnes. Thank you.